John Stark. John will spend some time talking to us about the Redmond Economic Development Projects. I first want to charge the guy that's a Patriots fan in the back of the room. For every time they win, he puts a dollar in. Y'all will be the richest club in town. <laughs> He's had a real tough time being a Patriots fan over the years, right? Those guys just win everything, and they look even better this year, for sure, than the team to beat. For a Seahawks fan, that's incredibly true. <laughs> uh, I just moved my computer over here because my little uh, clicker it wasn't working. So I think I've got about 20, 25 minutes with Q&A. Is that accurate? Okay. I've got about 32 slides, so I've got to hit one, at least one a minute to, to make it. So a couple of them I'll fly through because they're just pictures. But I'm happy to be here. I've been a speaker here before. I'm John Stark, as uh, mentioned. I'm the Senior Director for Redmond Economic Development, which is a private nonprofit that's funded both by the city and private sector business to do economic development on behalf of the city of Redmond. And so we've been an organization since 1987, uh, and uh, I've had the privilege of leading the organization uh, for the last, going to be 11 years in November, so how time flies. Alan just asked me how long I was at the position I was at prior to this at Express Personnel. I was there for nine years. This is the longest I've been in a, any one job working for any one organization. As long as the community will have me, I think I'll, I found a home here. I really enjoy the work. So. And your wife must be happy too. She is. Right. Yep. So I moved from Redmond, Washington, to Redmond, Oregon. Uh, I didn't get confused trying to drive home one day and went to the wrong Redmond, like I've seen people do at the airport before. But uh, definitely found a home here. Wanted to live in a smaller community. Uh, Bellevue, the neighboring city to, to Redmond, was exploding, and so was Redmond, and it just didn't feel like home anymore. My parents started there in 1967 on a piece of farmland, so. That farmland today is now uh, Overlake um, Retail Center. Anyway, this is us, uh, economic development, and uh, the work we do is really around industry development. So we work specifically on traded sector industry, so companies that have products or services that are consumed elsewhere. So their products or services are actually exported out of the region, uh, non-retail type businesses, where the jobs resulting from those revenues generated outside uh, the area help improve our community and the property taxes and income taxes help uh, our county, cities, and our state uh, grow. So it's about uh, revenue growth for those entities. We do that in three ways, really business development, working directly with CEOs to help them move, start, or grow here in Central Oregon. So companies that are looking at Redmond as a possible place to do uh, business, uh, we're concierge to them, we help them figure out a to Z problem solving from permits to uh, site selection to incentives, finances, uh, et cetera. And then we also help existing companies expand and new businesses uh, start up. On the move side of things, we don't just wait for the phone to ring. And I have a slide here. I'll talk a little bit about some of our casting out of the community to areas and industries that we're interested in trying to bring to, to Redmond. We also collaborate and advocate for the business environment here to keep uh, Redmond and Oregon competitive. Uh, there's been a few losing battles on that front uh, in recent years, um, and then sustainable operations. So that's making sure we have adequate funding to support our staff on the initiatives that we put forth in our strategic plan. So that's a kind of a frontward-looking uh, overview of our strategic plan that you have right there and different things that we do. So, but what's been going on? Uh, many of you have seen me speak here in other locations. A uh, couple of years now, three years running, 2016, 17, and 18. The Milken Institute uh, rated us the, uh, the best performing small metro in the country, three years in a row. And that doesn't just happen by chance. They look at GDP growth, they look at wage growth, they look at job growth, population growth, uh, and we've had a very substantial uh, economic growth. I don't know if you know this, but uh, 2017, we were the fastest growing GDP uh, in the country. Uh, and that's about 8.2%. We are tied with a place, uh, Lafayette, uh, Louisiana, I think it is, back uh, east. But the Milken Institute has us up there at the top for the last three years. And if you look at the names on this, there is no other metro that's been in the top 10 list for the last four years running. So we were eighth in 2015, and in three years in a row, the Milken Institute uh, rated us best performing small metro. When I say metro, Metro is the Deschutes County area. Has to have a town over 50,000, that's Bend, and then it's the surrounding area. And Redmond's contributed more to the Metro growth than it ever has before over the last decade. So we're a big part of this, and that's part of why they've in the past called it uh, Bend Redmond MSA. It used to be called the Bend MSA, by the way. 
Uh, also, the Heartland uh, uh, Forward Foundation. This is funded by the Walton uh, Family Foundation. Uh, there's a guy named Ross DeVol. We brought him to this community to speak before. Uh, he's an economist. He does forecasts. And they did um, a study of the top 30 most dynamic metropolitans looking at the near and medium data to gauge prospects for future prosperity. And uh, these metrics include GDP, job, and wage growth, but uniquely it included jobs at young firms, firms that are less than five years old. And we've got a number of them here. Basics is a good example right near this location. They were zero employees, didn't exist six years ago. They started here in Redmond, built a new corporation, and they've got almost 180 people that are working there. In 2016, they were Oregon's fastest growing company. So we've had some good success with these uh, young entrepreneurial companies growing. Uh, we were number five, Ben Redmond, MSA on most dynamic metropolitans. And there was no other Oregon city uh, in the top 50, except for at number 50, Salem. So we were leading the state in this particular uh, analysis. Uh, in area development, I did have this slide last time I spoke, but as a place to locate a business, uh, Ben Redman uh, was uh, also noted in the top 10, number two, uh, by Area Development, which is a site selection magazine. This is a magazine that people look at that are involved in real estate based on what types of trends are happening with site selection. Uh, at the end of the day, this particular uh, analysis was uh, 384 metros and included 21 different economic analyses, so it's a pretty broad look at it. But it helps for us to have these types of things when businesses are looking at the area in terms of how we compete. And then this one most recently, and I'm pretty proud of this because it's not been revenue, this is based on small cities, and there was uh, 2,000, uh, excuse me, 12,000, 1,261 different small metros that were looked at. And this was a city-wide, not a metro-wide uh, look, and revenue was number four. And Ben was separate from us, number nine. So for the first time, I've seen Redmond ahead of Ben in one of these analyses. And it was really quite a coup, coup in our office when that happened. Uh, there were only two other Oregon cities in the top 75. Uh, Aloha uh, was number 76, I believe. And they looked at um, business environment. So these are the three categories. It's a little hard for you to see. But uh, Redmond uh, was number three in terms of the business environment. That talks about support services for businesses and how a company can move here and grow and be supported by the community. Number eight, in terms of access to resources, that's financing, incentives, uh, training, things like that. And then this is where we were actually really short, uh, business cost rank. And a lot of this has to do with some recent legislation around workforce policies like minimum wage, family medical leave, sick leave, and most recently the gross receipts tax that uh, was implemented, uh, will be implemented as of January 1st. So this one that we're particularly proud of. So the good work that's happening here and the things that our businesses are doing to help propel our economy forward is getting recognized by these analysis. And it really helps us promote the area uh, to would-be businesses that are looking here. So what are the numbers that are contributing to some of these analysis? Manufacturing growth in Redmond since 2010 was 81%. So uh, we have 81% more workers uh, in Redmond than we did. We're at 1,500. Uh, manufacturing employees, we were at 836 in 2010. And the wages collected by these people in this industry has gone up by 88%. So what once was in 2010 about $41 million in annual wages collected by our manufacturing industry is now $77 million. So that's money in the community that's being supported by products that are exported out of the area. And with that, looking at the state, so Redmond is here in blue. Deschutes County is in red, Bend is uh, yellow, and in Oregon is the straight line. So how do we stack up? Well, we're contributing to uh, Deschutes County's growth at 58% of manufacturing. Bend is contributing about 51%. And if you look at it to Oregon, 19% uh, is the manufacturing growth in the state, which we're contributing to. And then the U.S., 7.2%. So we've eclipsed the U.S. by 11 times. So you hear about things across the country, hey, manufacturing growing. No, it's really growing here, 11 times that rate. And the state at 19%, four times the state's level. And Oregon is known for a great place to manufacture, uh, mostly because we have low power costs, fairly low land costs, and then we have a, a, a trained workforce. And finally, the business climate is, is pretty good here. 
it is uh, weakening a bit with some of this legislation I mentioned before. And then uh, this was in the paper a, a couple of months back. There's always been this thing that Redmond was the bedroom community to Central Oregon. You live here, but you work elsewhere. Predominantly Bend. But the census data that came out um, through the ACS American Community Survey uh, indicated that we are actually a net in migrator of jobs. So about 500 people more come to work in Redmond than leave Redmond, region wide. Now that's a different number for Deschutes County, or for Ben, excuse me. Uh, we employ about 2,000 Ben resident, residents, but we ship out about 4,000 uh, people to go to work in Ben. So uh, effectively, we're not the bedroom community of the region. We actually import uh, more workers. And that's changed. Alan, when you were mayor, uh, that was a little different number. So it's uh, definitely changed. And it's changed because of our, the resilience of our companies coming out of the recession, some of the new companies that we've added or started, uh, and then the growth of uh, what some of our existing businesses. Good example of that is PCC Slosher. 2009, they employed about 209 people. Today, they're 460. And that company's been here since the mid-90s, I think, since uh, Phil Shaw Slosher brought it in. And it's later been acquired by Berkshire Hathaway. They do titanium cast parts. Uh, they're a big facility on the north end of industrial. So uh, when I uh, offered to do this uh, uh, presentation, I was asked to talk a little bit about some of the companies that have been moved, start, and growing here in Redmond. And so this is our three-year business activity. Every one of these companies, we helped do something with their facility, either build a new facility, expand their facility, move into the area, or start a business. So we've got Riff Cold Brew Coffee, Guy Spearworks, Hillsborough Air <coughs> Academy, Cabal Brewing, Nosler, who's been in Bend for decades, Springer Precision, Bebop Biscotti, who was in Bend, uh, Radian, that was in Salem, Initiative Brewing, a startup, Tensility was in Bend, they moved out of California a few years ago, and then decided to find something a little more affordable here in Redmond. Mackenzie Cascade, they're a, a heavy equipment, heavy excavation contractor. Gompers Gin's brand new, I mentioned PCC Slosher. Traeger Grills, pretty big name, an Oregon-born company. Uh, they actually purchased Pacific Pellet, which was a business we started here, one of my first projects in 2009. Medline Renewal, medical device processing company. Pacific Fabrication or Pack Fab, Central Urban Garage Door, the De Leon Corporation, Snow Temp, Composite Approach, Triagenics, and uh, Treasure Valley Coffee. So, how many of you know five of the businesses on this list? Pretty good number. How many of you know ten? Wow, that really shrunk. <laughs> How many of you know all but three? Josh in the back's pretty. How do you know about them? Just out in the community, or I use these companies, or yeah. Very good. A lot of consumer goods up there. We're seeing a lot of that. A lot of consumer goods in the pipeline. I'll show you in a few minutes. So we touched every one of these companies in the last three years. Helped them uh, do some capital in uh, investment uh, uh, investments, add jobs, again building structures, equipment. And uh, we've helped you know, many more companies, but these are with substantial economic development projects. We don't count the things where we spend a couple of hours providing information or resources or referrals. This is the last uh, five years for us. So since 2014, uh, we've had 56 projects. About six a year uh, has been the average, but last year we did eight. We've done four this year. Uh, with those projects, uh, those 56 projects, 1,723 jobs were created or retained here. So it's not just manufacturing. There's distribution companies that we work with. There's technology-related companies that we work with. Uh, so we've helped catalyze the growth of 1,700 uh, jobs here in the Redmond community and about $77 million in capital investment. 2017 was the largest uh, job creation we had in the past six years. And then 2018 was the most uh, completed projects we've had in 10. So we've definitely had a really strong year in terms of completing these projects. John, uh, go ahead. Will you count when those new hotels come online? Will you that won't factor into this, right? No, because we're really focused on the uh, industry. Okay. You know, we've supported a couple of things that the hotel groups needed uh, in terms of data and information, but it's not substantial enough help that we that we call it a done deal for us. It's if we engaged in a CEO over a month over month, year over year, I mean, BaseX took 17 years mm -hmm. to make that happen. If we're engaged with a company, you know, and spent hours and hours, weeks and weeks and months and months on projects, 
and you can go to the CEO and did Ready help you? Mm -hmm. And if they say no, they're not up here. So it's only you know companies that we've substantially helped get their projects done. So in the hotel is generally not. Uh, and then in 2019, year to date, we've got four done deals so far this year, 75 jobs, about 4.5 million in capital investment. The biggest one is moving composite approach out of their facility on First Street uh, over to a facility over off Jack Pine in the 15th. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. Top three challenges we're facing, workforce availability and readiness. Within that, there's uh, the readiness part of that is really about our internship program, which I'll talk about in a minute. And another not so new issue that we're facing, Alan's involved with, with childcare. So we don't have enough childcare seats in our community to serve the demand. Frankly, we only serve about 30% of the demand. So three in 10 kids in our community are receiving childcare when there's 10 that need it. So that data was uh, produced by uh, Neighbor Impact here not long ago. So we're working on that as well. Uh, construction cost, something that's a little bit out of our control other than trying to help our local jurisdictions understand that construction cost is part of our economic development and if it gets too expensive people frankly won't build. Uh, but right now labor and materials have gone up 30% over the last five years so it's more expensive to build than it was. And then finally because we've had this success and a lot of absorption of our industrial space and I'll have a slide on that in a minute too, uh, we, we're now building some industrial space to put businesses in but those new buildings that have gone up have absorbed most of our one acre lots. We have six left in rent. So if someone comes here and says, on a one acre lot, I got six options to show. <coughs> and so we're trying to get someone to do an industrial park to break up a larger piece of land into one acre parcels, Josh. Is a lot of this um, built to suit or is it all spec building that do that building? Good question. So the development, I'll, and I have a slide on this in a minute, uh, it's either owner occupied or it's spec. There's actually only been one build to suit in the community over the last 10 years. More businesses are looking at it because they don't want that asset on their balance sheet. And they're also concerned about, you know, having ebbs and flows in the economy and having a risk of that asset on your balance sheet. So here's our internship program. We do this through Youth Career Connect. We've placed over 100 uh, high school and college students in businesses here in Redmond since we started the program in 2017. Our goal this year is to place 100 students again this year. This is publicly and privately funded both through East Cascades Works, our Workforce Investment Board, uh, as well as some other contributions from foundational support. COCC helped us get it uh, seated in the very beginning. REA, Revenue Executive Association, is a big funder of this. But at the end of the day, we know if we can give kids more work experience, they'll be better prepared for their careers in the future. I don't know if you know this, but in the 80s and 90s, about 60% of kids worked by the time they were 24. That number's down to about 32%. So less than half the number of kids that worked in the 80s and 90s work today. And a part of it's because we have these common core curriculums that require a lot more for kids in school. And then finally, they have a lot more things to do in academic sports and so forth. So we put a lot more demand on our youth, but there's still a need and a will for us to give them some of this work experience. We think it's the best way to get them ready for a career in the future, whether it be exploration or actually finding the thing that they want to do. So. Uh, and then I won't get too much into the slides here, but if you don't know this, our Ribbon Airport, we are very lucky to have them. They are absolutely killing it right now. They are adding new flights on a regular basis, so we now have new destinations for Chicago, uh, San Jose, excuse me, San Diego, Phoenix, and uh, Las Vegas. And now, for the first time, we have four destinations that have multiple airlines serving that destination. That keeps the ticket prices lower. That gives you more chances or choices in terms of who you want to fly with and it also creates a competitive market for them not to cancel flights because you can hop another plane uh, to that market. So right now for the size of our population, our employments are, are projected to exceed the employments for Medford which is like twice the population and Eugene which is like five times the population. So we are really hitting above our weight if you will. Uh, at the airport. That's very much important to our economic development because a lot of companies need to get customers in and salespeople out. So it is part of our economic development strategy. Here's the vacancy rate trend, Josh. So this is uh, available industrial space. Uh, this is the absorption. So in 2013, Jenny's laughing because she used to build this slide for us. So she was building these uh, slides for us years back. and. So we were up as high as 30% vacancy rate in industrial. Uh, we had about 1.2 million square feet at the time. 
uh, through these areas, and we've added space to the point where uh, 1.6 million square feet now. Uh, these are spaces that are 3,000 square feet and up, so it doesn't count the real small stuff. Our vacancy rate last quarter, quarter one in 2019, was 1.8%, uh, which was the lowest inventory, lowest number since we had uh, in 2000 with an inventory of about 400,000 square feet. So we're, <coughs> we have a lot more space, the vacancy rate's low. It bumped up a little bit because we added a bunch of new buildings, and I'll show you a slide on that next. Um, this year to date, we've added about 42,000 uh, square feet of a new, new industrial space. There's a whole bunch more about to release to the market. This is that slide I was mentioning. So this is all speculative. The stuff in green and orange, green is done and available to the market, and uh, yellow is under construction, hasn't been fully delivered yet. And then the white is future. So this is about 293,000 square feet we're adding in speculative development. And then if you add our owner-occupied, uh, about 120,000 square feet of, of companies that are building buildings for themselves, uh, total is about 412,000 square feet. So we had about a 1.2 million inventory. We're adding about 20 to 30% more inventory in industrial, just industrial, not commercial buildings here on the east side of the railroad tracks. Why? Because that absorption and that vacancy rate is so low. We've got developers uh, working hard to build buildings uh, for us so we can meet that demand. Where's it happening? So it's a little hard to see here, but these stars are where these buildings are happening at. So you've got it spread mostly throughout the community. A couple of pictures of the buildings that are going up. These guys are going to break ground. This is in the Smith Rock Industrial Park. This is the corner of 11th and Jack Pine. Uh, this building is actually um, uh, right behind us, so over on Deerhound. Uh, it's going up as well. They're about to release it to the market. And then that one is over on uh, Kingwood, excuse me, uh, 7th Street, uh, just north, uh, excuse me, south of Jack Pine. And that's about a 10,000 square foot building uh, that just got released to market here in the last month. So a lot of new space. This is that one I just mentioned over by Jack Pine and on 7th. This is uh, the one behind us over here on Deerhound, uh, 8,500 square feet of spec. About a 12,000 square foot building, a company named Autoclore. They do dishwasher uh, chemicals for restaurants and uh, other eateries and so forth. And then this one is on Lake Road. There's actually three buildings. And once they're filled, they'll build three more buildings. Uh, this is tech equipment. So if you've been up by the Home Depot and you've seen that uh, overpass, it's kind of behind. Here's a traffic light on the overcrossing uh, there. That's tech equipment. They do uh, Volvo and Mack truck. They're a dealer. They also do. Uh, repair and maintenance, and they'll compete with like Pape Kenworth that built about six or seven years ago. Uh, that was one of our projects as well. And then Snowtown, if you ever drive up 9th Street, you see this really tall building, which we haven't had a really tall building built in Redmond. This is a cold storage facility. This is Snowtown. They're out of Albany and Eugene. They have about 300,000 square feet of cold storage there. This is about 35,000 square foot cold storage. Because a lot of the beverage and food companies that need cold storage were shipping their products over to Eugene and distributed out from there. Mm -hmm. They needed cold storage here, and it's extremely expensive for a small business to put a cold storage in their facility. So these guys are the answer to that. And they also do what's called 3PL, third-party logistics. So they'll take your product, that's all you have to do. They'll interface with your POS system, point of sale system, and they'll actually ship product as it's ordered uh, from your business. So they do third-party logistics as well. So kind of a unique thing for us to have here. We think that having this business in our town will uh, trigger a number of companies that aren't in Redmond today that are in food uh, to start their business uh, here to Redmond as well. So it's a great asset to have. And right now, there is no other solution in Central Oregon. So uh, and then composite approach. These guys are a composite shop. They do contract work. They also build aircraft kit planes. Uh, this is the one that was over here on First Street. This is uh, uh, 15th Street, and that's Jack Pine. So a corner of 15th and Jack Pine on the east side, uh, just uh, south of the uh, landfill out there. That's a uh, composite approach, brand new, 24,000 square foot building. That was about a four year project to make that happen. In fact, I got word they were moving out of Redmond because they were here in a lease building. They said they couldn't find space. And I tried to get them to stay because I found them a space, but they'd already signed a lease on the building, which they had later bought in Bend, and so they left. There was a couple other reasons they left. And for three years, I kept calling them and saying, we really want you back in Redmond. 
and were a lot cheaper than Bend. And finally, they decided that when they were going to buy a, a piece of dirt and build a new building, they decided to do it here. So we were able to convince them to do that, and we're glad to have them because they're a really neat business. This is specific fabrication. I took this on Monday. Uh, this is on the corner of 6th and Umatilla. Uh, they do a pre, uh, so they're a construction company. They also own Central Oregon Garage Door. But they do a lot of metal work for staircases and decorative staircases and decorative wrought iron and cast iron and steel. Uh, they're a fabrication uh, facility that they're putting on that site. That's the former Medline uh, location, which uh, they built a new building here about two years ago uh, over off Hemlock. So what else? Uh, enterprise zone. Uh, so the revenue enterprise zone is a property tax incentive just for the first three to five years to help encourage businesses to move the community. Redmond's had a very active zone. In fact, one of the most active uh, rural zones. It's still a rural zone because we're been a, we've been under thirty thousand people, um, and it provides three to five year property tax exemptions for companies that are expanding or moving to the area. It has to be new. We don't take anything off the prop property tax rolls, but. We've managed this program since 2008, and typically we've had between 10 and 15 and up to 18 businesses using, but today we have 29 businesses using the Enterprise Zone, uh, and those companies are expected to invest about $48 million, create about 514 jobs, and we're scheduled to go through a redesignation process of that zone. You have to do it every 10 years. Uh, this is our number one incentive. Without this, Facebook doesn't exist in front <coughs> Apple doesn't exist. Basics might not be here. Medline would not be here. Medline had some other choices, and this program helps offset some of the costs that are very important to put into your labor and workforce at those critical times when you need to expand, you need to pay for facilities, and you can't always you know, afford it all. So, uh, And we had 14 applications in 2018. So Jenny remembers doing these about one a quarter, sometimes two a quarter, uh, 14 applications in 2018. So we were exceptionally busy, typically six to seven. We do in a year, and we have uh, double that. So a lot of activity in enterprise on today. Uh, recruitment activity. So how do we generate these leads? How do we, you know, get businesses to think about revenue? Well, a lot of people know about Ben, but they don't know about revenue. So we have to educate them. So we attend a number of trade shows. We're a part of a group called Team Oregon through our statewide trade association, uh, and then additionally we go to uh, these trade shows. We go to the Shot Show, which is an outdoor uh, gear. Uh, show includes firearms down in Las Vegas. We go to Anaheim for Natural Products uh, West, which is more uh, nutraceuticals and uh, food-based uh, companies. And then finally, the, I should have started at the top, but I've been using a new uh, technology called Gazelle AI, AI Artificial Intelligence, that uses internet data and algorithmic uh, uh, formulas to track down companies that have some expansion ahead for them. And so this is something we've uh, invested a little bit in, in terms of money, and a lot of it in terms of time. But uh, it helped us generate leads, 24 last year. And right now on my desk, I've got about 150 companies uh, that has generated leads for us to follow up with. So uh, we're definitely using new technology today uh, and uh, leveraging some of these uh, folks that uh, put together <coughs> software uh, to help us generate leads versus going to a trade show and talking to 200 businesses to get one or two leads. This is helping us comb tens of thousands of businesses with data and information and then let, narrowing the field based on our criteria. So uh, that's really helping us a lot. There's no sil silver bullet to this type of uh, work, but it requires time and you can't do the same thing every year. You have to be creative. And we feel like we're kind of on the cutting edge with this Gazelle AI in terms of what we're doing. Penny projects, uh, working on about 23 right now. Uh, that number's down from last year because we put a lot of projects on the ground. We've had some new ones come in, but we've also retired some older ones that have said, well, maybe in a few years we move that out of our pipeline. And if all those companies came to fruition and created about 611 jobs, about $80 million in capital investment, so those companies are in the final stages of making a decision. We're waiting for a yes or no. We've already engaged them. We've already provided proposals or sites. Uh, we've already talked about incentives. Uh, we're waiting for them to make a final decision. So who is it that's looking at us? I'm moving fairly quickly now because I've got a few minutes left. Uh, advanced Manufacturing is our largest, uh, excuse me, two uh, companies in the industry sector. So the top one's here, second one here. Uh, agricultural products, aviation and aerospace, building products. Consumer goods is still our biggest uh, industry uh, looking at us. Uh, and then outdoor products and specialty manufacturing. The advanced manufacturing is primary metals. 
PCC Slosher would be a, a, an advanced manufacturing company. In terms of company size, like what size of companies are living in us, this is the jobs they've created in our community. Uh, a majority are smaller companies, which is great, because we'd like to move them here and help them grow. Ben Lyon moved to Revan in 2004 with 14 employees and they're 240 a day. So we'd like to move them in small and help them grow. And then uh, six to 20, about nine projects, and then we have some larger ones too, two in both the uh, 21 to 100 employees and uh, two in the 100 employees or more uh, level. And then this is kind of interesting because most of my startup projects have started up. So a lot of the projects we have, we usually have three or four startups that we're working with right at this moment in time. I'm not working with a startup that's trying to start a business in the next year. So most of my uh, projects split right down the middle are uh, recruitment or business expansion retention, meaning they're already in business and they're trying to expand. Uh, and then I mentioned the kind of the recruitment. We're kind of an advertising firm too, so we cast out information to try and get people interested. This is the visitor guide ad we put together for the Redmond Chamber, and we're playing on the traffic, right? And it was actually pointed to Ben too, because Ben's having a tough time with traffic these days. And that's ahead for us too. I think the city's doing some things to plan for it. Uh, they're uh, ahead on a number of fronts. They've always tended to be ahead of things in terms of planning. But uh, the whole take on this is this is what we call congestion in Redmond. <laughs> the ducks cross the road, you just lost a few minutes of your time getting to work. At the top it says, your seven minute commute just became eight. <laughs> <laughs> That's traffic in Redmond. And then here we talk about, we have space for you. So this talks about, uh, at the time, about 240,000 square feet of speculative development underway and about 2,000 acres of available land, and about 1,000 single-family living uh, spaces being developed, including uh, master, uh, excuse me, multifamily as well. So that number's gone up a bunch since we put this together uh, last year. So that's what's going on. That's what we're focused on. That's what we're hearing, our trends, and that's what's happening in our business world. I'll take some questions, Dave. Um, those uh, jobs that you just mentioned, What's the average starting wage on those? You know, manufacturing starting wage is about $47,000 a year on average. So, you know, that's about 16 to $18 an hour. But those are, you know, middle wage uh, jobs. Some of those facilities uh, hire at a much higher rate. So average wage manufacturing about $47,000 a year. Yep. Yeah. I want to express my appreciation for the great job you do for Redmond. Thank you. First. Yes. Second, what's going on with the large lot industrial development that was supposed to happen over here? It is happening. So the annexation agreement's been approved by the city uh, and by DSL, and DLCD has uh, approved it as well. So no appeals on that. So it will become 960 acres, about 140 for the fairgrounds, about 20 for the Oregon Military Department, and the balance of about 700 will be large lot industrial. Large lot industrial means 50 acres or more. So we have a master plan that has multiple 50-acre parcels and two 100 and one 200-acre parcel. <coughs> DSL under the annexation agreement is required to put about $2 million worth of infrastructure in. So that's being designed as we speak. And then they'll start the construction process for that. That won't be all the infrastructure. And you know we're going to have to do some other things to get that served so it can be as shovel-ready as a would-be buyer would want. But that has been recognized as the region's large lot. So centrally located with the airport uh, right nearby was a strategic decision to have that here. But we're talking large scale manufacturing, large scale distribution that would occur there. Those projects don't come around often, but now we have something to show. So as soon as we get the infrastructure in, we'll be able to start marketing that. And then DSL will start uh, marketing alongside of us to try and find a buyer. One of the things we have to do, Ann, is we have to solve the issue that it takes the state a lengthy period of time, like a year, to sell a piece of land. And as you know, you want that done in 60 days or less. So we need to fix that. And that's the work that we do. There's one more question back here. What's the projected timeline on that? For DSL and everything? Another year. Yeah, we're working on all this stuff now. I think that year will take about a year, depending on the winter we have on the infrastructure. And we're working on this land sale process as we speak. So probably 12 months. Very nice. Yeah. Um, are you going to, does the road have to be put in? Yeah, so that's part of the infrastructure. The whole road won't be put in, but there'll be some improvements made to it. That's 19th Street. And eventually we want 19th Street to go all the way down, not necessarily to Bend. We think it should, 
but we have some hurdles to cross to get there. But certainly to Quarry or Elkhorn are the two natural cross streets for us. We just don't know which one yet. John, will you be able to stay around and answer a few questions? I can, yeah. Do you want to close up the meeting? Good. Thank you very yep. much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.